Hello, welcome to Free Speech Zone once again. Well, I'm going to kind of hurry through this. Over the last several episodes, we've been talking about the deep state or the secret government or um, national security state. And I've been exposing the myth of American exceptionalism as far as our behavior militaristically is concerned and showing that, yes, it is possible that American leaders could do that to their people concerning 9-11. We, we started out talking about the, uh, uh, the one that Kennedy thwarted, the North Woods uh, proposal that was signed off by the chiefs of staff and only President Kennedy made it not happen. Uh, all the way up through the Gulf of Tonkin resolution to start us in Vietnam. And uh, then I showed you the last week the USS Liberty and uh, how Israel and the United States conspired to kill lots of Americans without any hesitation to try to get America into the Middle Eastern War there in 1967. Uh, they wanted to bring nukes in so that we'd wipe out Iraq and Egypt, do the dirty work for Israel. Um, I, I said before that Israel actually did 9-11. Well, yeah, they were part of it, but so were maybe five or, or more different uh, agencies, including the uh, MI6 and others, Mossad, and so on. Well, I'm going to go ahead and, and show you right here. This is a, a Fox News clip that was played once and then they archived it and took it out, of, you know, got rid of it as much as they could. But this is that is kind of poor quality uh, because it's been bounced around so much. But basically, what this shows is the uh, the reporting of all the Israeli spies that were rounded up right after 9/11. And I mean, we're talking about hundreds of them, and uh, they were deported or some of them were imprisoned. But uh, well. This, then we'll come back and we'll try to bring it up to more current levels. So, so take it away. Let's. It has been more than 16 years since a civilian working for the Navy was charged with passing secrets to Israel. Jonathan Pollard pled guilty to conspiracy to commit espionage and is serving a life sentence. At first, Israeli leaders claimed Pollard was part of a rogue operation, but later took responsibility for his work. Now Fox News has learned some U.S. investigators believe that there are Israelis again very much engaged in spying in and on the U.S., who may have known things they didn't tell us before September 11th. Fox News correspondent Carl Cameron has details in the first of a four-part series. Since September 11th, more than 60 Israelis have been arrested or detained, either under the new Patriot anti-terrorism law or for immigration violations. A handful of active Israeli military were among those detained, according to investigators, who say some of the detainees also failed polygraph questions when asked about alleged surveillance activities against and in the United States. There is no indication that the Israelis were involved in the 9-11 attacks, but investigators suspect that the Israelis may have gathered intelligence about the attacks in advance and not shared it. A highly placed investigator said there are, quote, tie-ins, but when asked for details, he flatly refused to describe them, saying, quote, evidence linking these Israelis to 911 is classified. I cannot tell you about evidence that has been gathered. It's classified information. Fox News has learned that one group of Israelis, spotted in North Carolina recently, is suspected of keeping an apartment in California to spy on a group of Arabs who the United States is also investigating for links to terrorism. Numerous classified documents obtained by Fox News indicate that even prior to September 11th, as many as 140 other Israelis had been detained or arrested in a secretive and sprawling investigation into suspected espionage by Israelis in the United States. Investigators from numerous government agencies are part of a working group that's been compiling evidence since the mid-90s. These documents detail hundreds of incidents in cities and towns across the country that investigators say, quote, may well be an organized intelligence gathering activity. The first part of the investigation focuses on Israelis who say they are art students from the University of Jerusalem and Bazalel Academy. They repeatedly made contact with U.S. government personnel, the report says, by saying they wanted to sell cheap art or handiwork. 
Documents say they, quote, targeted and penetrated military bases, the DEA, FBI, and dozens of other government facilities, and even secret offices and unlisted private homes of law enforcement and intelligence personnel. The majority of those questioned, quote, stated they served in military intelligence, electronic surveillance intercept, and or explosive ordnance units. Another part of the investigation has resulted in the detention and arrests of dozens of Israelis at American Mall kiosks, where they've been selling toys called Puzzle Car and Zoom Copter. Investigators suspect a front. Shortly after the New York Times and Washington Post reported the Israeli detentions last month, the carts began vanishing. ZoomCopter's webpage says, We are aware of the situation caused by thousands of mall carts being closed at the last minute. This in no way reflects the quality of the toy or its saleability. The problem lies in the operator's business policies. Why would Israelis spy in and on the U.S.? A general accounting office investigation referred to Israel as Country A and said, quote, According to a U.S. intelligence agency, the government of Country A conducts the most aggressive espionage operation against the U.S. of any U.S. ally. A defense intelligence report said Israel has a voracious appetite for information and, quote, the Israelis are motivated by strong survival instincts which dictate every facet of their political and economic policies. It aggressively collects military and industrial technology, and the U.S. is a high-priority target. The document concludes, quote, Israel possesses the resources and technical capability to achieve its collection objectives. A spokesman for the U.S., excuse me, the Israeli embassy here in Washington issued a categorical denial saying any suggestion that Israelis are spying in or on the U.S. is, quote, simply not true. There are other things to consider, and in the days ahead, we will take a look at the U.S. phone system and law enforcement's methods for wiretaps and an investigation into the possibility that both have been compromised by our friends and allies overseas. Brett? Carl, what about this question of advanced knowledge of what was going to happen on 9-11? How clear are investigators that some Israeli agents may have known something? Well, it's very explosive information, obviously, and there's a great deal of evidence that they say they have collected. None of it necessarily conclusive. It's more when they put it all together. A bigger question, they say, is how could they not have known? Almost a direct quote, Brett. Yeah, this going to the fact that they were spying on some Arabs, right? Correct. All right, Carl, thanks very much. We reported on the approximately 60 Israelis who had been detained in connection with the September 11th terrorism investigation. Carl Cameron reported that U.S. investigators suspect that some of these Israelis were spying on Arabs in this country and may have turned up information on the planned terrorist attacks back in September that was not passed on. Tonight, in the second of four reports on spying by Israelis in the U.S., we learn about an Israel, Israeli-based private communications company for whom a half dozen of those 60 detained suspects worked. American investigators fear information generated by this firm may have fallen into the wrong hands and had the effect of impeding the September 11th terror inquiry. Here is Carl Cameron's second report. Fox News has learned that some American terrorism investigators fear certain suspects in the September 11th attacks may have managed to stay ahead of them by knowing who and when investigators are calling on the telephone. How? By obtaining and analyzing data that's generated every time someone in the U.S. makes a phone call. One sitting in state, please. Here's how the system works. Most directory assistance calls and virtually all call records and billing in the U.S. are done for the phone companies by Amdocs Limited, an Israeli-based private telecommunications company. Amdocs has contracts with the 25 biggest phone companies in America and more worldwide. The White House and other secure government phone lines are protected, but it is virtually impossible to make a call on normal phones without generating an Amdocs record of it. In recent years, the FBI and other government agencies have investigated Amdocs more than once. The firm has repeatedly and adamantly denied any security breaches or wrongdoing. But sources tell Fox News that in 1999, the super-secret National Security Agency, headquartered in Northern Maryland, issued what's called a top-secret, sensitive, compartmentalized information report, TSSCI, warning that records of calls in the United States were getting into foreign hands, in Israel in particular. Investigators do not believe calls are being listened to, but the data about who's calling whom and when is plenty valuable in itself. An internal Amdocs memo to senior company executives suggests just how Amdocs-generated call records could be used. Quote, 
widespread data mining techniques and algorithms, combining both the properties of the customer, like credit rating, and properties of the specific behavior. Specific behavior such as whom the customers are calling. The Amdocs memo says the system should be used to prevent phone fraud, but U.S. counterintelligence analysts say it could also be used to spy through the phone system. Fox News has learned that the NSA has held numerous classified conferences to warn the FBI and CIA how Amdocs records could be used. At one NSA briefing, a diagram by the Argonne National Lab was used to show that if the phone records are not secure, major security breaches are possible. Another briefing document said, quote, it has become increasingly apparent that systems and networks are vulnerable. Such crimes always involve unauthorized persons or persons who exceed their authorization, acting on exploitable vulnerabilities. Those vulnerabilities are growing because according to another briefing, the U.S. relies too much on foreign companies like Amdocs for high-tech equipment and software, quote, Many factors have led to increased dependence on code developed overseas. We buy rather than train or develop solutions. U.S. intelligence does not believe the Israeli government is involved in a misuse of Amdocs information, and Amdocs insists that its data is secure. What U.S. government officials are worried about, however, is the possibility that Amdocs data could get into the wrong hands, particularly organized crime, and that would not be the first time that such a thing has happened. Fox News has documents of a 1997 drug trafficking case in Los Angeles in which telephone information, the types that Amdocs collects, was used to, quote, completely compromise the communications of the FBI, the Secret Service, the DEA, and the LAPD. And we'll have that and a lot more in the days ahead, Brett. Carl, I want to take you back to your report last night on uh, those 60 uh, people who were Israelis who were uh, detained in the anti-terror investigation and the suspicion that some investigators have that they may have picked up information on the 9-11 attacks ahead of time, not passed it on. There was a report, you'll recall, that the Mossad, the Israeli intelligence agency, did indeed send representatives to the U.S. to warn just before 9-11 that a major terrorist sure, attack sure. was imminent. Why does that not, how does that leave room for uh, the lack of a warning? Well, I remember the report, Britt. We did it first internationally right here on your show on the 14th. Uh, what investigators are saying is that that warning from the Mossad was nonspecific and general, and they believe that it may have had something to do with the desire to protect what are called sources and methods in the intelligence community. The uh, su suspicion being perhaps those sources and methods were taking place right here in the United States. The question came up in the Select Intelligence Committee on Capitol Hill today. They intend to look into what we reported last night and specifically that possibility, Brett. So, in other words, the problem wasn't the what, lack of a warning. The problem was lack of, the, of useful details. Quantity of information. All right, Carl, thanks very much. Coming up next... Israeli-based company called Amdocs that generates the computerized records and billing data for nearly every phone call made in America. As Carl Cameron reported, U.S. investigators digging into the 9-11 terrorist attacks fear that suspects may have been tipped off to what they were doing by information leaking out of Amdocs. In tonight's report, we learned that the concern about phone security extends to another company founded in Israel that provides the technology that the U.S. government uses for electronic eavesdropping. Here is Carl Cameron's third report. The company is Comverse Infosys, a subsidiary of an Israeli-run private telecommunications firm with offices throughout the U.S. It provides wiretapping equipment for law enforcement. Here's how wiretapping works in the U.S. Every time you make a call, it passes through the nation's elaborate network of switchers and routers run by the phone companies. Custom computers and software made by companies like Comverse are tied into that network to intercept, record, and store the wiretapped calls and at the same time transmit them to investigators. The manufacturers have continuing access to the computers so they can service them and keep them free of glitches. This process was authorized by the 1994 Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, or CALEA. Senior government officials have now told Fox News that while CALEA made wiretapping easier, it has led to a system that is seriously vulnerable to compromise and may have undermined the whole wiretapping system. Indeed, Fox News has learned that Attorney General John Ashcroft and FBI Director Robert Mueller were both warned October 18th in a hand-delivered letter from 15 local, state, and federal law enforcement officials who complained that, quote, Law enforcement's current electronic surveillance capabilities are less effective today than they were at the time Kalia was enacted. 
Converse insists the equipment it installs is secure. But the complaint about this system is that the wiretap computer programs made by Converse have, in effect, a back door through which wiretaps themselves can be intercepted by unauthorized parties. Adding to the suspicions is the fact that in Israel, Converse works closely with the Israeli government and under special programs gets reimbursed for up to 50% of its research and development costs by the Israeli Ministry of Industry and Trade. But investigators within the DEA, INS, and FBI have all told Fox News that to pursue or even suggest Israeli spying through Converse is considered career suicide. And sources say that while various FBI inquiries into Converse have been conducted over the years, they've been halted before the actual equipment has ever been thoroughly tested for leaks. A 1999 FCC document indicates several government agencies expressed deep concerns that too many unauthorized non-law enforcement personnel can access the wiretap system. And the FBI's own nondescript office in Chantilly, Virginia, that actually oversees the Kalia wiretapping program, is among the most agitated about the threat. But there is a bitter turf war internally at FBI. It is the FBI's office in Quantico, Virginia, that has jurisdiction over awarding contracts and buying intercept equipment. And for years they've thrown much of the business to Converse. A handful of former U.S. law enforcement officials involved in awarding Converse government contracts over the years now work for the company. Numerous sources say some of those individuals were asked to leave government service under what knowledgeable sources call troublesome circumstances that remain under administrative review within the Justice Department. And what troubles investigators most, particularly in New York in the counterterrorism investigation of the World, Ter World Trade Center attack, is that on a number of cases, suspects that they had sought to wiretap and surveil immediately changed their telecommunications processes. They started acting much differently as soon as those supposedly secret wiretaps went into place. Brett? Carl, is there any reason to suspect in this instance that the Israeli government is involved? No, there's not, but there are growing instincts and an awful lot of law enforcement officials in a variety of agencies who suspect that and have begun compiling evidence and a highly classified investigation into precisely that possibility. Brett? All right, Carl, thanks very much. On a long-standing government espionage investigation, federal officials this year have arrested or detained nearly 200 Israeli citizens suspected of belonging to a, quote, organized intelligence gathering operation. The Bush administration has deported most of those arrested after September 11th, although some are in custody under the new anti-terrorism law. Cameron also described an investigation into the possibility that an Israeli firm generated billing data that could be used for intelligence purposes and described concerns that the federal government's own wiretapping system may be vulnerable. Tonight, in part four of the series, we'll learn about the improbable roots of the probe, a drug case that went bad four years ago in L.A. Los Angeles, 1997. A major local, state, and federal drug investigation sours. The suspects? Israeli organized crime, with operations in New York, Miami, Las Vegas, Canada, Israel, and Egypt. The allegations? Cocaine and ecstasy trafficking, and sophisticated white-collar credit card and computer fraud. The problem? According to classified law enforcement documents obtained by Fox News, the bad guys had the cops' beepers, cell phones, even home phones under surveillance. Some who did get caught admitted to having hundreds of numbers and using them to avoid arrest. Quote, this compromised law enforcement communications between LAPD detectives and other assigned law enforcement officers working various aspects of the case. The organization discovered communications between Organized Crime Intelligence Division detectives, the FBI, and the Secret Service. Shock spread from the DEA to the FBI in Washington and then the CIA. An investigation of the problem, according to law enforcement documents, concluded, quote, the organization has apparent extensive access to database systems to identify pertinent personal and biographical information. When investigators tried to find out where the information might have come from, they looked at Amdocs, a publicly traded firm based in Israel. Amdocs generates billing data for virtually every call in America, and they do credit checks. The company denies any leaks, but investigators still fear that the firm's data is getting into the wrong hands. When investigators checked their own wiretapping system for leaks, they grew concerned about potential vulnerabilities in the computers that intercept, record, and store the wiretapped calls. A main contractor is Converse Infosys, 
which works closely with the Israeli government and under a special grant program, is reimbursed for up to 50% of its research and development costs by Israel's Ministry of Industry and Trade. Asked this week about another sprawling investigation and the detention of 60 Israelis since September 11th, the Bush administration treated the questions like hot potatoes. I would just refer you to Department of Justice with it. I'm not familiar with the report. I'm aware that uh, some Israeli citizens have been detained. With respect to why they are being retain detained and the other aspects of, of your question, whether it's because they are in intelligence services or what they were doing, I will uh, defer to the Department of Justice and the FBI to answer that. Beyond the 60 apprehended or detained and many deported since September 11th, Another group of 140 Israeli individuals have been arrested and detained in this year in what government documents describe as, quote, an organized intelligence gathering operation designed to, quote, penetrate government facilities. Most of those individuals said they had served in the Israeli military, which is compulsory there, but they also had, most of them, intelligence expertise and either worked for Amdocs or other companies in Israel that specialize in wiretapping. Earlier this week, the Israeli embassy here in Washington denied any spying against or in the United States. Tony. Carl, we've heard the comments from Ari Fleischer and Colin Powell. What are officials saying behind the scenes? Well, there's real pandemonium described at both the FBI, the DEA, and the INS. A lot of these problems have been well known to some investigators, many of whom have contributed to the reporting on this story. And what, is, what they say is happening is supervisors and management are now going back and collecting much of the information because there's tremendous pressure from top levels of all of those agencies to find out exactly what's going on. At the DEA and the FBI already, a variety of administrative reviews are underway in addition to the investigation of the phenomenon. They want to find out how it is that all this has come out as well as be very careful because of the explosive nature and very political ramifications of the story itself. Tony. All right, Carl, thank you. Okay, it has now been more than you 16 see how years. absolutely twisted and involved all this can get. Everybody is covering up and cheating and conspiring and uh, seeing after their own interests. I mean, Israelis are using all that spy network to spy on their industrial partners. Uh, just like we are. I mean, that's the main reason for all that spying anyway. They they write it off as national security, but the only reason they really do it is blackmail and and uh, economic cheating. But, um, okay, so all this is going on, and we know that 9-11 was the uh, pretext, the excuse for the war on terror. Now, just as the... Uh, Operation Gladio across Europe, where our uh, Western intelligence agencies were committing bombings and other things and blaming it on the terrorists, it justified their existence, um, mainly blamed on communists, because we were worried about communists, and that was the, the thing that got the public all inspired, communism. Well, okay, so we're going to go to, this is a real treat, if you want really good information that you can, you know, put your teeth in and actually research, find out that it was true, more uh, information is available. This is uh, James Corbett. He's a scholar in his own right, and he's been doing a lot of research on Gladio, Operation Gladio, and how it has morphed into Gladio B, which is taking it from the European arena into the Middle East. And Keep in mind, these people are ruthless. They don't care who they have to kill to make a profit. They don't care who they have to kill to gain power. And they sure really love getting the United States to do all the dirty work whenever possible. Well, we're going to play this uh, uh, James Corbett clip, and we'll be back in about 19 minutes. in car crashes that mysteriously resembled the Sisterlick crash itself. And according to at least one FBI whistleblower, Sisterlick marks the beginning of a transition from the original Gladio operations using ultranationalist operatives to a Gladio Plan B involving Islamic terrorism as the conduit for the strategy of tension. The whistleblower in question is Sibel Edmonds, hired by the FBI to work as a translator in the Washington field office in the wake of 9-11.
She worked with agents around the United States, helping to translate intercepted communications in a number of counterintelligence cases, including Agent Joel Roberts in the Chicago field office, whose targets included Abdullah Chatley and some of his Gladio associates. While there, one of the translators she was working with, uh, Jan Dickerson, uh, was Jan Dickerson, who had worked for both the American Turkish Council and the Assembly of Turkish American Associations, organizations that the FBI publicly confirmed were targets of FBI counterintelligence operations. Her husband, Douglas Dickerson, was a major in the U.S. Air Force who had served in Ankara working on weapons procurement for the Pentagon in the Central Asia region. In December 2001, the Dickersons visited Edmonds and her husband at their home in Alexandria, Virginia, and attempted to recruit them into a Turkish spying ring that had penetrated the FBI, the Pentagon, and the State Department. She refused, and her complaints about the Dickersons and their involvement with Turkish lobbying groups eventually led to her firing. After years of fighter, fighting this dismissal and attempting to go on record with her knowledge, first through official FBI channels and then through the court system, the FBI was eventually forced to admit that her claims had, quote, some basis in fact, a judgment later bolstered by a Department of Justice Inspector General report that concluded, quote, many of Edmund's core allegations relating to the co-workers were supported by either documentary evidence or witnesses other than Edmund's. And noting that, quote, the evidence clearly corroborated Edmund's allegations, unquote, about Jan Dickerson's work problems. Despite all of this, a little-known evidentiary rule known as the State Secrets Privilege was invoked by the Justice Department to remove her First Amendment rights and prevent her from going on record about many of the specifics of her case. This led to her being labeled, quote, the most gagged person in American history by the American Civil Liberties Union. Edmonds paints the story of the FBI's counterintelligence operations against a Gladio network that had contacts and operatives in the United States but protection from powerful Washington players, like some of those on the board of the U.S.-Azerbaijan Chamber of Commerce and similar organizations. After the turning point at Susurluk, these operations started to focus on Islamic terrorists and radicals, who presumably could equally well be used to maintain a strategy of tension and help ac accomplish foreign policy goals in Central Asia and the Caucasus region. Again, it's important to look at some of the careers of some of those who have been identified as part of this Gladio B plan uh, in order to better understand whether or not they are, in fact, what has been claimed about them. However, we have to note that unlike in the case of Abdullah Chatli, we have no official independent confirmations of the existence of the Gladio B operation or its various op operatives. Here we are relying on information in the public record which corroborates Edmund's claims and paints a vivid picture of the intersection between Muslim extremists, drug runners, terrorists, and money launderers with the upper levels of the U.S. State Department, Pentagon, and NATO. One such person is Fatullah Gulen, a Turkish imam who fled political prosecution in Turkey for advocating that an Islamic state replace the existing Turkish government. Interestingly, he fled to the United States eventually settling in Pennsylvania. He then set up an educational foundation, the Gulen Movement, and within four years had opened up 350 madrasas in the Central Asia Caucasus region. His network would go on to include Islamic schools in over 140 countries with an estimated net worth of over $20 billion. In January 2001, a Turkish prosecutor, citing an Ankara University report whose author was subsequently assassinated, claimed that there is a link between Gulen and the CIA, which included agency help in securing passports for the school's English teachers in the Central Asia Caucasus region. This claim was bolstered by former Turkish intelligence chief Osman Nuri Gundes, whose memoirs revealed that 130 of those English teachers in Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan alone were actually CIA operatives, issued special diplomatic passports under a pro program codenamed Friendship Bridge. Interestingly, the Washington Post attempted to deny the allegations by seeking comment from Graeme Fuller, who you might remember as the author of the Central Asia, the new geopolitics report that we referred to earlier. Uh, Fuller was a former CIA station chief in Kabul who claimed that the idea of a Gulen CIA connection was improbable, despite admitting he has, quote, 
absolutely no concrete personal knowledge whatsoever about this, end quote. Even more interestingly, talk about non-denial denials. Even more interestingly, Fuller himself wrote a letter of reference for Gulen that was then used in Gulen's ongoing legal battle over his immigration status in the US. The remarkable rise of this imam, with no particular background or accomplishments, to become the head of a multi-billion dollar Islamic school network operated from a secret compound in Pennsylvania that appears to be working with the CIA in the highly sensitive Central Asia Caucasus region, appears to fit in line with what we know about the deep state actors in this covert battle for influence in this highly prized square of the chessboard. Another extremely interesting figure is Yasin al-Qadi. He was an alleged financier of Islamic terror that was the subject of an intensive investigation by FBI agent Robert Wright. Wright's investigation, codenamed Vulgar Betrayal, discovered evidence that implicated al-Qadi in a terrorist financing ring centered in Chicago that linked to the 1998 African embassy bombings. But when he proposed a criminal investigation, his supervisor flew into a rage, yelling, quote, you will not open criminal investigations. I forbid any of you. You will not open criminal investigations against any of these intelligence subjects, end quote. Wright was taken off the vulgar betrayal investigation one year later, and the investigation itself was shut down the following year. In 1999 and 2000, the UN placed sanctions on al-Qadi, who was identified in UN Security Council resolutions as a suspected associate of al-Qaeda. At the same time, Al-Qadi was also a key investor in a company called p which marketed enterprise architecture software designed to provide complete God's eye view of an organization's structure from transactions, systems, and processes to inventory, transactions, and personnel. And p client list included some of the most sensitive databases in the United States, including the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, DARPA, in the Pentagon, the FBI, the Secret Service, the White House, the Navy, the Air Force, the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, and NATO. According to PTEC's own business plan, the company had a contract to work on modeling the FAA's network management, network security, configuration management, fault management, performance management, application administration, network accounting management, and user help desk operations that was operative on the morning of 9-11 and FAA's failure. After 9-11, PTEC's offices were raided and the company's CEO and CFO were eventually indicted and Yasin al Qadi was placed on a special terrorist finance watch list by the US Treasury Department. Despite being watchlisted by the U, both the UN Security Council and US Treasury Department, Al Qadi continued to operate internationally with an Albanian passport spending time in Turkey. He, is, he has since been revealed to have engaged in numerous meetings with then Turkish Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan and the Turkish intelligence chief. And earlier this year, the ex Istanbul police chief revealed that Erdogan had helped Al Qadi to enter the country several times despite being banned by the cabinet. And for those who are wondering, yes, this is actual surveillance footage of Al Qadi meeting with Erdogan, the prime minister of Turkey at the time, in 2012. Another figure of importance whose name comes up in connection with this investigation is Ayman al Zawahiri formerly bin Laden's right-hand man and the current nominal leader of the Al-Qaeda organization. According to Edmonds, he appeared as a figure in several FBI counterterrorism investigations in the 1990s, turning up in Turkey, Albania, Kosovo, and Azerbaijan. He traveled to the Balkans in the mid-1990s, and that makes sense given Al-Qaeda involvement in the so-called Yugoslav Wars, but his involvement in Turkey and Azerbaijan is of particular relevance to this study. Edmonds, claim that he worked, uh, Edmonds claims that he worked with the Turkish arm of NATO and NATO itself during this period, meeting several times with US military attaches in Baku, Azerbaijan in the 1997-1998 window. There are numerous such leads and clues in this investigation that point to, oh, sorry, one more. 
Other tantalizing connections present themselves in figures like Hussein Bibison, known as Europe's Pablo Escobar, for his heroin operations smuggling heroin to the UK. After his imprisonment here in the Netherlands for drug smuggling, he contacted Edmonds with details about Turkish NATO involvement in the drug smuggling operations he had been a part of. There are numerous such leads, connections, and clues in this investigation that point to a deep tie between NATO and US uh, covert operations and this important area of the globe. But what does it all mean? It would be a satisfying conclusion to this investigation to present to you definitive proof, documents, or testimony positively linking the increasingly deadly terror attacks and incidents taking place in the Central Asia Caucasus region to a Gladio Plan B group being directed by NATO and the Pentagon. Everything that we have seen today has demonstrated that A, there are vital strategic interests for the US and its allies in the Central Asia Caucasus region that make it a prime target for covert operations. B, such strategy of tension operations have been conducted in the past by people we definitively know were linked to NATO's covert army, and C, that there are a number of influential people operating in and around the region and in close cooperation with the Turkish deep state, American intelligence, the Pentagon, and NATO, who seem to be involved with ongoing operations today related to the fostering of religious extremism in the region. As I say, it would be satisfying to conclude definitively that A, B, or C persons were connected to X, Y, or Z events, but obviously that isn't possible at this time. The very nature of these covert operations means that without some explosive new evidence or surprising new testimony from other whistleblowers, it is unlikely that Gladio B will be revealed in the way that the original Gladio operations were. Uh, another fascinating story that we could get into but it would take too much time. This does not mean, however, that we are completely powerless to identify these operations or to counteract the psychological effects that they are aimed at producing in the public. The characters, events, and storyline painted in this presentation are almost completely available in the public record through news reports, government investigations, think tank documents, court filings, interviews, and dozens of other sources. Those parts of the story that cannot be independently verified, like some of Edmund's claims, can be corroborated by the sources in the public record. The task of piecing these bits of the puzzle together is a nearly overwhelming one, but it can be accomplished by a concerted effort by an informed and motivated public. This is the principle of open source investigation, which I am attempting to further with my work at CorbettReport.com. And next week, this lecture will be published on my website, along with a hyperlink transcript sourcing every single document in this report and other evidence used in the creation of this presentation. From that point, the public is encouraged to use that source information to begin investigating other aspects of this case and to see how this narrative meshes or clashes with other pieces of evidence in the public record. Members of the Corbett Report community are, of course, invited to participate in this investigation by logging onto the website and posting their own comments, analysis, links, and replies at the posting on CorbettReport.com. This task is critical because in the quest to control the resources of the Central Asia Caucasus region, a strategy of tension is being employed. We see a nearly daily parade of terror attacks in the North Caucasus region on Russia's doorstep and in the New Silk Road area of Chinese interest. Just this month, the head of the Collective Security Treaty Organization, often seen as a counterbalance organization to NATO, claimed that instability in the region was being deliberately fostered by the West, citing a disproportionate increase in U.S. embassy staff and influx of Western-backed NGOs into the region. Quote, the West crudely interferes in the eternal affairs of other governments, trying to manipulate public opinion, economically and financially affecting the government and population, he said. If this is indeed the case, then one of the key ways to counteract this effect is to simply retain our skepticism when it comes to spectacular terror attacks in the region. With an increased awareness of covert operations, false flag attacks, and other acknowledged instruments of terror in the strategy of tension, we thereby disarm the effectiveness of these tools. 
The psychological manipulation that these geopolitical machinations rely on is only possible if the pub public is kept in fear and ignorance, and the answer to that can only be understanding and openness. And with that, I thank you for your time and attention during this very detailed lecture, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Okay, that's a, remember, go to uh, James Corbett. It's the CorbettReport.com. Uh, great thing. So anyway, hey, but by the way, you guys can uh, relax. If there's ever an emergency, you can, re you can be uh, comforted with the knowledge that I will be working hand in hand with FEMA and Homeland Security as part of the Amateur Radio uh, Emergency Services. And this is the book that they put out, the Public Service Handbook. And here's the Field Resources Manual for the Amateur Radio Emergency Services. So there's lots of stuff going on. You can be on the inside and on the outside at the same time. Okay, we're, we're going to move right along because we just don't have enough time. We're going to go straight to a video from Russia Today. And th this is the latest thing that just happened uh, uh, over torture. Obama was supposed to end torture. When it came right down to it, no, he just re-upped. So go ahead and let's play this um, back in five minutes. While the so-called CIA torture report is expected to finally be released next week, this according to multiple sources, including Senator Dianne Feinstein, the chairwoman of the Senate Intelligence Committee. The report, which has been three years in the making, had been held up in recent months after a standoff between the Senate panel and the CIA over allegations that the agency had been spying on the investigation. In late July, the CIA admitted to penetrating a computer network used by Senate staffers. The report had also been caught in limbo between the administration and the Senate as they battled over what would be released and how it would be defined. One of those battles included how to define torture. Even though it was the expected premise of the report, we're now learning the executive summary will be completely absent of that terminology. To discuss the very latest, I was joined earlier by former CIA analyst Ray McGovern. I first asked him what he thinks led them to author an entire report on torture without using the word torture. Well, it's cowardice, rank cowardice. Torture is very clearly defined in U.S. law and in international law to which we're a part. Um, we prefer to talk about enhanced interrogation techniques, and most people don't realize that that is a direct, literal translation of Verschaffte Vernehmung, enhanced interrogation techniques, right out of the Gestapo manual, and I have a copy of that manual at home. So, and a lot of the techniques were the same, too. Now, I will say that the, there is some good that comes out of this. I'm recollecting that on the day that George Bush decided to reveal that these enhanced interrogation techniques, he called them an alternative set of procedures, were very effective and all that. Three hours before he got up before the White House, General John Kimmons got up before the Pentagon and said, and I quote, no good information has ever come from abusive interrogation techniques. History shows that, and the empirical evidence of the last five years also demonstrates that. He's talking 2006 minus five, when it started, when we invaded Afghanistan. Now, uh, that's a professional, okay? So no good intelligence is ever gonna come from torture. So one might ask, well, hello, why would they do it? Mm -hmm. And I have a novel explanation that no one has adduced yet. Good intelligence can't come from torture techniques, but if you want bad intelligence, I gotta tell you, torture works like a charm. Mm -hmm. So if you wanna prove that Al Qaeda was in very close with Saddam Hussein, mm -hmm. man, if we can get, can't get people to confess to that, send them to the Egyptians, which is exactly what happened. Alibi, he confessed. The President of the United States used that the week before the vote, whether to allow the U.S. to invade Iraq. It works like a charm. So if you want bad information, torture really works, whatever you call what, it. What's so strange is that we actually heard President Obama himself uh, you know, address this activity as torture. I want to take a listen to that thought very quickly. Mm -hmm. Even before I came into office, uh, I was very clear that uh, in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, uh, we did some things that were wrong. 
We did a whole lot of things that were right, but we tortured some folks. Do you think changing the terminology in this report could have an impact on the way people actually perceive the information and perceive what these officials were signing off on? Mm. Well, I think that that's not likely. I think the American people have been given a uh, given the belief that torture resulted in accurate information at TV, uh, you know, all these shows and, and books and so forth. Now, the reality is that that's not right and that the CIA, as indicated in this report, lied about it. They lied to the Justice Department who authorized these things on the notion that they worked and they lied to the congressional investigators who were supposed to be monitoring that. So whether the American people care about this is really dependent on whether the American people learn about it. Now, right before Christmas, they, they released this thing, presumably, and uh, people will yawn and say, well, yeah. And the people who get away with this will not be held accountable, and that's the only way to prevent it from happening again, have accountability. It's, it's such a disappointment to me, not only that my former colleagues let themselves be suborned into doing this kind mm -hmm. of thing, but that the, that the authorities, the people that the president, we tortured some folks, well, hello, what, right. what kind and of And it's unclear if, if we'll really see some action, if we'll see uh, any change whatsoever once this report comes out, and that's the unfortunate truth. Well, CIA analyst Ray McGovern, we've run out of time, unfortunately. Mm. Thank you so much for coming on and weighing in on that. You're most welcome. Yeah, the, the torture report won't come out until they figure out how to successfully, uh, you know, mute it. Well, anyway, um, one of the techniques that, that's used a lot is to keep you guessing. You know, what are they talking about? They said this last week. They said something completely different this week. Oh, no, I don't know what they mean. Well, we're going to watch a clip about Obama, what he said before, what he says now, and well, we'll be back just before the end of the show with another short clip, and then we'll see you next week. Believe me, the idea of, of doing things on my own is very tempting. <laughs> this notion that somehow I can just change the laws unilaterally is just not true. We've, we are doing everything we can administratively. There are laws on the books that I have to enforce. There's been uh, a great disservice done to the cause of getting the DREAM Act passed and getting comprehensive immigration passed by perpetrating the notion that somehow by myself I can go and do these things. It's just not true. We live in a democracy. You have to pass bills through the legislature and then I can sign it. And uh, you know, if, if all the attention is focused away from uh, the legislative process, uh, then uh, that is going to lead to a constant dead end. These last few years we've seen an unacceptable abuse of power, having a president whose priority is expanding his own power. Any guess on who said that, Mr. Speaker? It was Senator Barack Obama. Here's another one. No law can give Congress a backbone if it refuses to stand up as a co-equal branch. The Constitution made it. Senator Barack Obama. What do we do with a president who can basically change what Congress passed by attaching a letter saying, I don't agree with this part or that part? Senator Barack Obama. What if the whole purpose of government was to negate freedom? What if freedom was a myth? What if the Constitution meant nothing to the government? What if everything the government has or owns or controls has been stolen? So wherever and whenever I can go ahead and help families like yours, I've got the legal authority to do it, I'm going to do it. On the subject of immigration today, later today, we'll have a press conference with some members uh, who are urging the president to act, uh, to use his executive authority uh, to improve the situation. Because the president no longer, no, no, not only has the legal authority to act, uh, but all the precedents of presidents before, uh, from Eisenhower, Kennedy, Nixon, you know who the, most of them before you were born, some of you, but uh, Nixon, Ford, Carter. There are actions I have the legal authority to take as president 
the same kinds of actions taken by Democratic and Republican presidents before me that will help make our immigration system more fair and more just. Tonight, I'm announcing those actions. His decision to take unilateral action on immigration, action he himself said exceeded his authority, and makes it harder for the American people and their elected representatives to trust his word on any issue. What you're not paying attention to is the fact that I just took an action to change the law. Now, but this is an issue not really focusing on immigration, but instead is an issue about how the president is violating the Constitution by imposing his own powers that really reside with Congress. So we certainly are hopeful uh, that Congress is going to, uh, to view this as, uh, as a motivation, you might say, uh, to try to take action finally on common sense, comprehensive immigration reform that'd be good for border security, that'd right. be good for national security. What I'd like to see the president do is finally acknowledge all of the people that have been killed by illegal aliens. This is not a story about my son. This is a story about over 100,000 people that have been killed since the last amnesty and are getting killed at the rate of 5,000 a year. Most of them, about 60 percent, are being killed by people that are in the country illegally but have not committed any what what the administration calls serious crimes these borders being wide open it's not just the people from from mexico and south america who are coming across our borders now there are bigger issues that we need to be worried about and there's no time spent in jail for most of these felons in 2013 they released over 36,000 not 300 or 3,000 36,000 illegals from our jails and detention centers to go back on, onto our streets and commit more crimes because there is no protocol with the government of how they're handling these these criminals. So you told the world that you are going to deport these four people with ties to a terrorist organizations. That's not what happened. Two of them were released. They're in, they're in, they're in deportation proceedings. Uh, an immigration judge released two of the four uh, and they fled to Canada. Uh, my intent is that they be deported, uh, but two of them are in Canada seeking asylum. Where, where did these two, where were they anticipated going and where did they actually go? I'm not sure of their exact whereabouts, sir. Mr. Secretary, this is the problem. You come and you say, you tell the world you're, you're, that you're going to deport these four people tied to terror. These are terrorists. And you don't. They get released. They go to... My understanding is they go to Arizona, they go to the state of Washington, they cross illegally into Canada. They each put up $25,000 bonds. Doesn't that beg a lot of questions about what you're doing in deporting criminals? These people have terrorist ties. And I'm getting tired of the Democrats with this right to, righteous indignation saying that we can't find a Congress we can work with. Well, the first two years of the Obama administration, the Democrats had the House, the Senate, and the presidency, and they did nothing on immigration. I sat on the subcommittee. They brought Stephen Colbert in to testify. That's how bad it was. It is confusing, and it poses a bit of a hypocrisy, I think, to the American people, because then after the election, he reversed his course. After the election, he says that now he does have the legal authority to move forward. And so uh, we don't know, who should we believe? The president before the election who said he didn't have legal authority to take this action? Or the president after the election who says that he does have the authority to take this executive action? Congressman, what I know is we spent months developing these reforms, and we spent a lot of time with lawyers very close consultation with lawyers. There were some things that they told us they thought we did not have the legal authority to do, which is reflected in the OLC opinion. Mm -hmm. And there were things they told us very clearly that we did have the legal authority to do. The analysis was very thoughtful, very time consuming, and very extensive. And I'm satisfied as a lawyer myself and the person who has to come here and defend these actions that what we have done is well within our existing legal authority. I, 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 know, I, I have no doubt in, with respect to your integrity, but I think the timing of these statements makes it look more political to me, that this is a political decision rather than a policy uh, decision. Uh, nearly 20 million Americans woke up this morning either uh, unemployed or underemployed. Now, the President didn't mention these Americans uh, when he announced his plan to grant de facto amnesty and work permits to up to 5 million 
illegal immigrants. He didn't discuss the competition this would create for them or the impact it would have on their pocketbooks. And your series of memoranda outlining this policy for him didn't mention them either. To address this problem and protect the American worker, I introduced legislation prior to the President's announcement that would make clear that illegal immigrants benefiting from his executive amnesty are not authorized to work in the United States. When it, when it comes to illegal immigration, the conversation is always about the illegal immigrant, not about the people that it will affect. And you see, Mr. Secretary, I don't think it's fair, especially around the holidays, to put illegal immigrants ahead of the American worker. Secretary Johnson, the President keeps saying that his executive action will boost the economy. So tell me, how will adding at least 5 million new competitors to the workforce make it easier for the unemployed Americans to find a job? Congressman, the fact is, as I'm sure you know, that we have lots of undocumented in this country working off the books. And if that's not apparent, then I suggest you spend some time in a restaurant here in the Washington, D.C. area to see it for yourself. What we want to do is encourage those people to get on the books, and I will provide them a work authorization so that they may legally continue in the But how does that make it easier for the American worker? We keep talking about the illegal immigrant. Here we go again, talking about the illegal immigrant and how we can make it easier for them. How does this help the American worker who can't find work and can't provide for his family? Who's fighting for them? My question for you, uh, Mr. Secretary, is what, what do you say to someone who believes the President took action to change the law? We did not change the law. We acted within the law. Can you play the clip? This is from uh, November 25th. This is the President in Nevada talking about this. What you're not paying attention to is the fact that I just took an action to change the law. So you say he didn't change the law, but the President says he changed the law. We acted within existing law. We acted within our existing legal authority. Listen, I've been a lawyer 30 years. Somebody plays me an eight-word excerpt from a broader speech, I know it would be suspicious. Uh, I'm Sus <laughs> okay. At one point he said, I just took action to change the law. Did the President misspeak in a moment of uh, a sort of uh, passion? To try to calm the crowd, or does he fundamentally, and do you fundamentally believe that he has taken action to change the law? Uh, I think he was speaking colloquially. What you're not paying attention to is the fact that I just took an action to change the law. You want the best that's out there at the lowest price anywhere? Yeah. It's a commercial. Block that out. Hey! Get rid of it. Shit.